black hole. I'll, I'll also I'll also be doing a uh, a Facebook Facebook live. Should we all do from all different angles? From, yeah, from, right. As right. many social media. And we're both in a reflection too, so. Possible. Ooh, we are. Yeah, we are. So you can kind of oh, do the hands. You can see that I'm not, 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 see quite, Mike here. Yeah. not quite a vampire. You can still see my reflection. In your head. Ah, yes. With the random. Oh, that's. I'm that's sparkling nice. like I'm a vampire, like I'm it's super bright. I know. Sparkles going on. We gotta get some light dimmers. Don't, don't hate because I know my There we go. References. Okay, so, so now you're live on Periscope. On, on Brandy's Periscope. Would, Periscope. Would you guys can come and watch us on Twitch as well. So this is, this is really cool because we're actually we're in the podcast booth up at Nirvana Coffee, and there's like people playing. Board games down there. There's oh people yeah. People playing board games down there. Right there yeah, there are Gearbox employees playing board games. It's pretty awesome. So, Randy, now that we have you on the show, one of the things that we like to do uh, at the beginning of every segment, and this is a new segment, tell okay. us, tell us what Nerdvana is and what it is, oh, and what it is to you, and what it is to you. <laughs> Nerdvana is the place where I get uh, drinking chocolate. Yeah. And play board games and uh, eat. The best pork chop I've ever had in my life. It's Very delicious. Mike was actually talking about the pork chop. Pork chop, pork chop because we, we on the show we've talked about I think the chicken fried steak every single episode. It's pretty good. But I haven't tried the pork chop, so I'm gonna have to probably get that. No, man. I know. I know. Apparently, I, I used to not eat pork, and now now that's all I eat. Then you kind of have to. That's a good thing. Yeah. Pig is delicious. Man. Yeah. Pig is delicious. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad we created it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Randy is here because we are actually uh, on the first floor. Hey, we got someone hosting. Thank you. Woo -woo. We are we this, are we are here on the first floor. Yeah. yeah, I know. Well, like we said, for 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 next time, we need to get like Shane to make a graphic of Ben Affleck with money spinning money eyeballs. Spin. <laughs> like no 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 no. Like I'll come back and direct for more money. Like like the old '60s Batman. How's that? But it zips out. But it zips out money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, or just like money spin. We get a new follower, and then you get bad half like hey, like with cash. And how do these Periscope people watch your stream? Like so, the Periscope people can go to yeah. Twitch TV forward slash Redbeard underscore TV. So Redbeard underscore TV. Redbeard underscore TV on Twitch TV. That's right. I'm gonna kill this Periscope, and I'm gonna do that. So go to Redbeard underscore Twitch. Underscore TV <laughs> on Twitch. Twitch. Redbeard underscore TV on Twitch TV. Twitch dot TV four yeah. slash this Redbeard underscore TV. There you go. We'll see you there. I'm yeah. gonna continue, and Redbeard is gonna be ask there. Me all be the square. Stuff. All the things. We'll all, the things. all the things. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Okay, so right. now, so we've killed one of the medias, and now we're back onto the Twitch. But yes, so as you guys have all heard, we've if you, if you're a return viewer, we've talked about Nirvana before. Uh, the podcast booth is actually in between Nirvana Coffee and Nirvana Spirits, which is a coffee shop behind us. So Nirvana Coffee was open first. Yes. And when Nirvana Coffee was open, did you and Christy have plans for Nirvana Spirits? Yeah, I mean the whole thing was was kind of planned together. It's just the coffee shop's like 1,200, 1,500 square feet. That's like Eight thousand, so right, different scope, and it's a little bit bigger. Took took a, took a few more months to get that one finished, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the, trying to live the dream. You know, you, you want a place where you can eat and drink and enjoy life, and be, be close to work, and at the bottom yeah. floor, like the yeah, 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 yeah. gearbox is upstairs. Gearbox is upstairs. We're yeah. like we're using a tripod from gearbox yeah. actually right now. So, <laughs> so there awesome. you go. So I mean, you kind of have done a lot for the city of Frisco because. The Gearbox software building, if you're if you're local to North Texas, you can drive by, you can see it. It's got the big, beautiful logo on the top of the building. <laughs> We're right here in Frisco Square. But you also help facilitate opening the, the video game museum. Yeah, the National Video Game Museum. Tell us about right that. here in Frisco, Texas. Have you been yet? No. Oh, my God. It's awesome. I know. So cool. I know. So, it, it's, uh, so these guys, I met, I met them like... I don't know, maybe eight years ago now. Uh, they had they they were at Dice, which is the annual summit for the Academy of Interactive Arts. You mm -hmm. see, every industry has an academy. They've got to give away their Academy Awards. Video games are no different. We have an academy. We get together uh, every February, actually this month in Las Vegas, Nevada. We have our award show where we honor the best games in the industry. That's where the Video Game Academy Awards comes from. And uh, and then we also have a summit. And during the summit, they had these guys had this display with like this awesome stuff. Like yeah, they had some classic arcade cabinets and they had some classic video game consoles, but they had some rare stuff like like patches that were given out as um, promotional materials for like games that no one's ever heard of for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred and just really cool, cool stuff. And I got to talking with them, and uh, it, they they're rad. They're they're these these three guys, John, Joe, and Sean. 
and they have been collecting for over 30 years, and they care about this stuff like more than we do as gamers. Like they right. care about everything. Like if you've got an old nasty T-shirt that has a video, something video game on it, they want it. Like they, they're 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 hoarders. They're actually sick. Yeah. <laughs> they're video they're, game hoarders. They, they are hoarders. They're, there's something wrong with them. But I'm grateful because whatever is wrong with them is help them amass this absurd collection. They have got rare stuff and possible stuff. Um, they once as a gift gave me a sealed copy of um, a brand new inbox unopened copy of Custer's Revenge for Atari 2600. If you nice. know this, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what that is, right? It's yeah. like the wrongest game ever made. It's some really horrifyingly racist oh God. Uh, and sexist. It's racist and sexist. Uh, game for that's uh, it's really shameful and it's and it's sitting pristine on yeah, the shelf. Yeah, and it, but, but it's become a collector's <laughs> item because it's so horrible it's the, just fact, awful, the yeah. fact that it even exists it's like the plot is your general custer and you literally rape an indian woman uh oh, and it's wow just, all right and that's it and you have to like maneuver your little general custer into this little pixelated you know Ten dots that were supposed to. That would be that would be AO yeah. rated now. Yeah, yeah. 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 no, it's it's, it's no, horrifying. It should not exist. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's it. yeah, because it shouldn't have existed in the first place. <laughs> I, think, right. I think I have a floppy disk of Oregon Trail somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you died of this entire now, that's, Oh yeah, man, fuck that game. Like oh, I would God. get like halfway through and I'm like, bullshit, snake killed my wife. <laughs> <laughs> what is this <laughs> game? Evil comes and like takes away your child and eats yeah. him. It was like, uh, and it was always like it was always something that was kind of like encouraged in school where yeah. it was like you can like you, you can't play video games but you can play the Oregon Trail and you'd sit there halfway through you're like this game is bullshit teacher and like the life is bullshit <laughs> history is not kind and that's the story of the Oregon that's Trail. right that's right so so yeah so we're here in Frisco it's amazing that you have the video game museum which we need to go we need to like it's fun do, like, it's pretty neat fun. honestly yeah. you go there and you'll just be like oh, there's so much nostalgia everywhere you'll just you'll love it it's well one time we need to have you over totally for drinks champ. at Mike's house and you can see his Batman museum <laughs> <laughs> I don't, know if you know the, oh, no. I don't know if you know this about about this guy. No, not but quite he, as impressive as a video game museum. That's true. It, it, it's Mike, a one-bedroom it's, museum, but it's it's still. <laughs> Mike, your, Mike, your Batman museum is a pain. Dude, problem, people, people, you got married. Sure, it is. So are you like a, are you a hoarder about Batman stuff? I, I would say a collector or aficionado. That's what they say. <laughs> not, That's not, what they say. Not a hoarder. They say <laughs> collector, but I mean you're a hoarder. So, yeah, dude, yeah okay. I'm a hoarder. So there's this bit. guy. This this guy is incredible. I met him a few weeks ago. Uh, a guy that lives in the greater Dallas area. I think it's out in like Grand Prairie or somewhere. And his thing is puppets, like marionettes. Oh, dang. He and has like, two Batman like, marionette like, puppets. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. kidding. That's the one I'm sorry. Yeah. Ventriloquist <laughs> puppets and marionette puppets. He's an old guy. He he lost his wife a few years ago, so he's alone now. And his entire house, it's taken over his entire house. Like, you can see what used to be the living room, and it's now this, mus this, this, this uh, I guess, you know, kind of, I don't want to say perverse, but it's like this obscene um, museum, the effigy of all this all this stuff. And then, like, the, the, the entryway, the, the, the hallways have been taken over. There's, it, it, bedrooms have been converted into this. It's absolutely nuts. And he's got hundreds. I think it's he's the largest. He has the largest puppet collection. Are you like in the world? Are you like in a marionette chat room, like online? It, it's it's insane. No, no. He's so, like, swing by the house, fam. So no. Uh, one of one of my things before a lot of some people know this. Before I became a game developer, I was a magician. And hence your Twitter handle, Duval. Yeah, yeah. So I was awesome. gonna get there organically, but I knew you would, Randy. Thank but, you. But no. So so I I, I I I there's this magazine, the oldest magic magazine it's called genie magazine if any by the way if anybody watching has any interest in magic and you want the real dope um consider checking out genie magazine because the best magicians in the world publish their work there and it's it, it'll you'll, you'll learn the shit you'll learn the real stuff it's a it's a, magi a magic uh magazine for magicians and it's 80 years old it's celebrating its 80 years 80th year and i'm kind of involved with it uh and it's still in print. Yeah, it's which is, still, which it's is a dying media. I know, right? Yeah. And so the guy that is the editor in chief, he was out at my house, and we were we were working on some things, and he just got this call because he's writing this book about this guy who had some some of these puppets, and the puppets were in this guy's collection, and so he's like, okay, we got to drive out there and go look at the stuff because it's research for my book, and I'm like, all right, I'll be your Huckleberry. I mean, yeah. let's go check this out. Oh, I'll go down this rabbit hole. And it was a freaking rabbit hole. I was in Wonderland. It was nuts. It was absolutely insane. This guy is a miracle. Like he, 
there, no no one has gone farther than this guy has with the world of marionettes and puppets, and it's uh, it's pretty impressive. I mean, anything like that is impressive. But yeah, anybody that has that kind of passion is no, like, you can't you, know. you can't if you can put that in a bottle, like you right. can't. It's just you can't bottle that. It's incredible. But these guys are like that for the video games at the video game museum. They're great guys, and the museum's incredible, and you just got to see it for yourself. Oh, and we will. And so if you guys ever visit North Texas and you are, are lucky enough and you guys come by Nirvana, you get some drinks. My favorite is the Christie's. I know you like, so, so a lot of people might not know this about you, but you don't drink. I don't. I've, never had, I've never had a sip of alcohol in my life. Wow. You, and, and this, you're is, the, this is part of the water. And you're, the, and you're the CEO of Gearbox, so like, there's something to be said about people who, <laughs> who maybe like, get more work I, done. My wife, my, <laughs> my, my, my wife loves craft cocktails. She loves wine. I think that's great. Well, I was going to say, like, the best, like, in my opinion, the best uh, martini, the best creation they have down in Nirvana Spirits is the Christie's. Yeah. Named after she, she, like I was lucky enough to hear the story of how she got that Twitter handle because you and some college friends That's would what we make, called it. Ra ra make random names up for your wife. And she was it was Christage. Well, we used to Christage, work, we used yeah. to work we used to add itch on everything. Hey man, what do you let's what should we do after class? Let's go play some frisbee. You know, and I was like, yeah. let's go play ultimate frisbee. We it's call the it frisbee. Yeah. Hey, should we get some climbage on? Like, cause we used to climb rocks up in California and stuff, and like. Um, Everything was edge, 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 and and so we we even add that to our name. So hey, have you seen Christage? You know, it's like yeah. that just <laughs> and it's stuck, and, and now it's just stuck. Now and that's now a good name, and now it's a delicious it's a drink as well. So that's that, that's her gamer hand, handle, and she named. But what's great about it is it's Christage. It's like adding edge to a word, right? But right like, when they see it printed in the menu, everybody calls it the Christige. Yeah, I thought it was like <laughs> <Christige. It's>, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, so that's good. Good. I always it's it so good. Yeah. She doesn't even bother correct people. She loves it. <laughs> so, so we got a couple people in 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 the thread oh, asking yeah. questions. They oh. want they want to know we're some gonna, gearbox we're questions. Sure, we're doing Q&A. So we're okay. going to do some Q and A. Let's we're going to this. Some. So, uh, how, how many people are, are watching this? Like, what's the likelihood I'm going to get myself into trouble here? I just want to know what kind of uh, what kind of risk I'm taking if I talk about secrets. About twenty five ish is what we're okay. averaging right now. You so guys are not cool, huge. right? We're everyone's cool. Gonna everyone's out. everyone's right. going to be cool. Is this recorded? Can people watch that back later? People can yes. watch it back later. Oh but, shit! But okay. we're okay. I mean, no, they can't, Randy. Okay. Of course not. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see. What so, so I was like, so I want I want to ask this one because I kind of know the answer. Okay. Um, will we see like D Willing asks? Um, it's not Borderlands related, but will we see another Brother in Arms franchise? Yes. Returning. Yes. The, the, yes. We. We, and I, I think I've said this in a few different places, we are working on a new Brothers in Arms game. We have been working on it for some time. We aren't announcing it yet. I don't want to like give anything away because we want to make sure we, we've got what we've got and that we know what we're saying before we, we jump the gun. Oh, one, of the, yeah. one of the cool things about, um, you know, we, we own the franchise and we are 100% in control of it now. Because uh, it was it was it was a Ubi title. Ubisoft published yeah. it, and they had publishing rights for the first Brothers Arms game, and then they got publishing rights for the second one. They got publishing rights for the third one, and then they got publishing rights for the fourth one. And that you know that that kind of mutated the franchise a little bit into the, this game, and it was announced. And it was called Furious Four, and it was it was kind of taking it away from its authentic roots and the way that I care about the Brothers Arms franchise. And a lot of that was driven by you know the, what the publisher willing to take a risk with the franchise and believing that maybe certain risks might increase its its reach. I'm happy with its reach. I, I don't I don't want to, to harm what it means, so I, I, I was kind of uncomfortable uh, with where it was going. But I loved I loved the gameplay of where it was going. But I just didn't like that being a Brothers in Arms franchise thing. So I, I went to Ubisoft and I talked to them about that and I tried to convince them that maybe we should make a new IP out of where the game was leading because the game was really fun. Um, but they weren't they weren't game for that. So so we had to negotiate, and we ended up um, agreeing on terms that would allow us to just kind of go on without them. And um, one of the benefits of that is now I'm like sometimes you know everyone always wants to know what we're doing, and I get it. But yet, but art is a process, and things change in the process. And when we talk about things too early, sometimes people get disappointed if we make decisions along the way that lead to the results different than things they saw earlier. So I, I, I want to, what I really want to do, and, and, I, and I do this as much as possible to the extent that I'm in control, is not make a promise until we know exactly what it is we're going to deliver. 
and in that way, then we can avoid any anybody disappointed. So, so it, yeah, we are working on the new Brothers in Arms game. No, we're not going to show anybody what it is because it's changing, it's mutating, it's evolving. You don't know what it is. I mean, I think what, you guys. Well, I think a really good example of that too was Borderlands ended up being such a different dynamic animal. Oh my god! Than right? what? Like, I mean, Game Informer had a cover art. And it was it was kind of very was realistic, very mad realistic max. and gritty, you know. And, and yeah. it's so interesting, right? Like we changed that dramatically, and there are still people that absolutely hate us because we we changed the art direction of that game. Now, fortunately, there's a lot of people that love the game, and there's also people that didn't even know it existed until it launched. That's basically that's most people for most games, by yeah. the way. Most most people, especially with new IP, they don't know about a game until until it actually is out in the world and it's being marketed and other people are talking about it. But um, in the case of Borderlands, um, you know, there's people that really are mad because they, they they got attached to the thing that was a work in progress. Right. Um, and, and and you could that's true for a lot of the games that we've done. Um, and there's you can kind of uh, uh, find. Uh, that those those feelings for, for games that, that we show off early. So so I, I, as much, the more control that I have over the process, then the more likely I am to want to hold back revealing what it is that we want to offer until we're ready to offer it so that people know what it is and know what they're getting and they, they, they can make their, their decisions about it on, on the merits of what it actually is. Yeah, and that's something that I've noticed that's kind of difficult with video game development is that when you make promises too early or you talk about a game too early, you, there can be a lot of negative backlash and something that you've dealt with personally. Oh gosh, it's so yeah. tough. And, and the thing is like when we, like as a developer, what I wish was we can be totally transparent about every step of the process. Because when we share the work in progress, we don't see it as making promises. We just see like, here's where we're at right now and here's where we think we're headed. Yeah. And, and I'd love to just keep exposing that. The problem is some people, when they when they see what you show, they get fixated on that thing that you showed, and that becomes the thing that they want. So if you change away from that, then they get mad at you. Yeah. Um, and we don't make any decisions trying to make anybody mad. We're we're just you know You're going, trying to make the best going possible through the part. artistic process, sure. you know, and and and, and always trying to lead towards this intent. It's and, and what the the thing we've discovered is when we make games is when people. Um, see a final product and they do not know all of the things we did not do they're they're fine right yeah they're fine because they don't know what we didn't do right they, they didn't walk into a press that's right, that's right. you know somebody today i don't know how they got a hold of it but somebody today was tweeting about the pandora cover art yeah 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 so we, what's interesting about that that was not Borderlands. What, what? I mean, there, there was there was a that was the project that became Borderlands. But but with the beginning, sometimes we imagine what a thing could be, and we do different treatments of it. There's a, there's another treatment very much like that one that is um, uh, uh, the title is Eon, and there's some slightly different features of that one. In fact, the guys that were kind of doing the treatments, they really wanted Eon to be the thing. They wanted that to be the title. Um, but they're just kind of they're they're not actual. Things. They're just sort of ideas of what might be, and you look at that, and then you end up somewhere. Um, uh, in fact, though, there was a time when when the, uh, we were we were sort of codenaming the project uh, Pandora because that's the name of the planet that it takes yeah. place on, of course. And um, and uh, well before the movie Avatar. Oh, no, well, after that. By the, well before fact, the, the, that, that I, I actually found the, the booklet, the, the PDF of that booklet that, that the guy posted on our network, um, and it was something we made in 2006, in early 2006, as part of a um, uh, we were doing a prototype demonstration with some publishing partners, and um, and that was sort of this this tool that would like as it was a companion for, for looking at the prototype tech, uh, tech that we were working on and um, uh, but it, it, it wasn't a game there was no world where that was ever going to be the box and there right. was no world where that was going to be the title actually though that that's not true the title uh, we, we proposed the title and we had a bunch of different um, possible titles that, that we dreamed up and one of the titles that I put out early on was Borderlands but I never took it seriously I put it out there like this doesn't work because it's stupid to call a planet lands right Bo the Borderlands are part of a planet they're not a whole planet yeah right, right? Yeah. but but it evokes the kind of feeling that I want so I threw that out there as a way like let's use this to try to find the correct title for the game and then all these ideas came through brainstorming, and I threw some in, and a bunch of people, other people threw in. And, and um, the, our publishing partner, 2K, 
uh, of the of the ones that that weren't ruled out, and I had ruled out Borderlands. I was using it as a sample, not as a as a, as a not as an actual title. Um, uh, they, they they tested some of them. They said, well, let, you know, it doesn't it doesn't hurt us and it doesn't help us, so let's just go with Pandora because we got to go with something because we, we were going to get the cover of Game of Thrones magazine. We needed a title. And so I uh, went up there, showed Andy Mack the game. You know Andy Mack? I know, Andy, yeah. I know Andy really well. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so Andy calls me after and he says, um, hey, dude, this is awesome. Holy shit, you're onto something. Um, uh, you shouldn't call it Pandora. Right. <laughs> now, here's what's funny about it. The reason why is that I got another game. It's either the month before or the month after cover. It also starts with the letter P. So if you could change your name to something that doesn't start with the so letter Andy P. Yes. 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 So Andy Yes. the name of the I said, I said, I, and I, I, didn't, I hated the name Pandora. I did not want to name the game. So I'm like, dude, tell the 2K guys that. So he had a conversation with the 2K folks about the same thing. And, uh, and and then Christoph calls me later and says, "Hey man, I think I think we really need to change the name of the game because it's you know, wild." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, "Really? Okay." And it then works. I, it works. Yeah, so I was well so grateful. And I went back to our list, and you know, we we brainstormed some other new stuff. But I, you know, I said, "You know what? Why can't we cut? like, even though Borderlands doesn't make sense, once it exists, it won't matter because." The word Borderlands doesn't mean Borderlands anymore. What it means is now it's the noun attached to this idea of this game. And that's what happens to all titles. So I'm like, let's just go for it. It evokes all the right feelings. Um, and I just vetoed everything else and I just made the executive decision because we literally had to make a call in like a, a day. Like I had like 24 hours and I just had to make the decision. So so from from what was kind of a throwaway idea that like invoked the spirit of the game, it turned was, into like on like on, in like in the last hour turned into the title yeah franchise. yeah it, it was like arguably your biggest franchise yeah right it, it was the prototype idea you know it wasn't the true it wasn't when I when I first put Borderlands out there I never meant it to be the title I just meant to do something like this but better and doesn't come <laughs> with the mistaken kind of association that the word Borderlands says you know the word you can't refer to a planet as Borderlands. Right, it just doesn't make any sense. It's nonsensical. Right. If I if I if I said to you, hey, let's um, uh, uh, let's go out to the borderlands, and I meant Mars, you, you would that you wouldn't parse that sentence correctly. It sure. wouldn't make any sense to you. <laughs> but it makes sense. I mean, but like you know, but now just, it makes sense. It makes sense in context. Yeah. And you guys yeah. also like very early in the game. I think within the first like ten minutes. It's, it's known that Pandora is the planet. Yeah, I mean, that, well, that whole Marcus speech is a whole different story. I mean, that sure. was a patch as we were finishing the game. Um, I, I, I was starting to really feel that, that the context, the fundamental context was missing. That, that Marcus intro happened because I'm like, fuck, I need to patch in some, <laughs> I need to patch in some context, some root kind of basis for all of this. Like, the game's great, the, the gunplay's great, the procedural generation of the weapons, the loot system, the growth curve, like, we had that all on lock. But we just didn't know what the fuck we were doing it for. <laughs> right. Right. There was no context. Like literally, the game was opening with the intro with the, the skag and the bus hitting it, and there yeah. was no context at all. So I'm like, okay, let's do this thing really quick. And um, uh, uh, we had this. You know, I was thinking about which voice should it be? Who's going to be our narrator? And I like Marcus. You know, when I was directing uh, with Mikey, the Marcus voice, the direction was like Sala meets Watto from Star Wars Episode One, you know, Sala yeah, from Indiana Jones. Yeah. And, and, and he, the voice actor just killed it on that. And so, okay, it's gonna be Marcus. So, so I wrote this thing really fast, threw it over to Mikey. He rewrote it, threw it over to me. We went back and forth like six times in one afternoon and then literally recorded it the next day. And then Scott Kester just scribbled out those little drawings like probably in like two or three days, had all that stuff done. Mikey threw it up in a video and edited it all together with the voiceover we just grabbed from um, uh, from, uh, from, from the voice actor, who, who, by the way, I think is the same voice actor that does Doctors at Dr. Ned, um, the, the Marcus voice actor. Right. And then, and then, uh, and then Petty uh, put some, some, I think it was either Mark Petty or Rayson Varner put the kind of ethereal kind of music kind of score behind it. And like that all came together like in a week. And it was, and it turned out like that was the whole, that, that really, without that, you would have been absolutely clu clueless because that's where we set up the idea of a vault hunter and the, the little legend of the vaults. And that's, that's where we set up the idea of Pandora and how dangerous the world was. And all of that context just would have been gone if that didn't exist. I, I mean, I think it was really important you did because arguably look, looking back historically, because I... Me personally, I'm a huge fan of the franchise. I have a Thanks. I have a claptrap tattoo, as you know. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I do. <laughs> I, I I've spent so you many had David, hours. You had David on last week. 
Yeah, yeah, we did. David David came up last week, uh, and I, I I remember when BL one came out, like the like the one kind of only complaint was just like. Well, there's not really, it's not really narrative driven, and it, and yeah. and in a way though that was kind of true to your roots because I remember, I remember being up and, and talking to people from the studio and and, and kind of the, the the overall idea that everyone pitched to me was like, well think like Diablo but yeah. like a shooter. That's right. And uh, in a lot of ways, you kind of did the same thing with Battleborn where you kind of took a MOBA and kind of made it a first-person shooter. Yeah. And someone actually had a question about Battle Pass. Okay. And uh, it's Mahugalung. <laughs> I'm saying that right. <laughs> These Twitch handles, come on. Uh, they want to know, Battleborn getting close to uh, finishing the Promised DLC. Yeah. Can we sit easily, easy knowing there will be a few more surprises for that game? Or will it take a backseat to something coming up, uh, uh, some uh, up-and-coming games? So there, there's an ongoing team that, that works on the Battleborn game, and... They've got a lot of big plans for it, and um, that, that's gonna. There's gonna be some attention on that uh, for some time. Um, the, the the fact though is, of all the developers in the studio, um, for gosh, oh, well over a year, um, I'd probably say around ninety percent of them are working on things that haven't been announced yet. Um, right. So, uh, but the, but the, the Battleborn team, I mean, those guys are so passionate and they're so, they're so hardworking and, and I love those guys and they've got some big plans. So the, the season, the season of season pass of DLC will be finished, but there's, there's some other stuff that, that we got coming. There was, um, I remember like, gosh, like six months ago, um, someone broke a story on the internet that Battleborn was going free to play soon. And I said, I debunked that. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> um, I did say there, there's probably going to be a point where we do a trial um, because we, we think that we think that if more people discovered the game, they would they would like it. Right. It, the, the, it's so weird for us, you know, because we've had about three and a half million people play Battleborn, which is a number like, man, we're so proud of that number. But um, the, 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 a lot of the world that pays attention to gaming, and, and most gamers don't, you know, most gamers aren't like us. Like you and I, like you're, you read the gaming news every day. Yeah. You, um, uh, you, were t you were educating me about some shit that went down with PewDiePie. Like, yes. before the, before the right. roll. like I didn't even know that because I'm, you know, I'm working. Disney does not like that guy right yeah. now. So, so mo most people, most people are just living in the world and they got other shit to do and they're not fixated on all the on all that they're not, they're reading, they're they're not reading the news sites they're not paying attention to all this stuff they just want to entertain that right but they have their lives that are more important um, and the entertainment is just sort of a component of their lives and that's cool but but the folks that are paying attention like dude the overwatch guys just killed it right like they're up to like 25 million folks yeah like, that's just amazing like that's right. that's unheard of and i i love that that happened because it kind of confirms my bet, right? Like it's pot. That's like before before Overwatch and, and Battleborn, that market was zero because there was no market, there was no product that was trying to do the hero shooter thing as a console, you know, triple A kind of bet. That just didn't exist. Um, I didn't know they were doing that when we started building Battleborn, um, and the fact that like after we announced and after we kind of lock ourselves into our launch path, they showed up out of nowhere. Was and Blizzard is like, hey, we're Blizzard. They, yeah, yeah, they're, they're just like, first new IP since StarCraft. How yeah. about that shit? Yeah, they're just we're like, gonna release it the same weekend as yeah, you guys. They just squished us, you know. And and I, but but you know what's interesting about that is, I, if if they didn't exist at all, like it would have been like to reach three and a half million people with the new IP, like that would have been amazing. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, but 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 it's 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 in a it's lot of ways. It's just relativity that in a lot of people's feel... in a lot of people's eyes, it's in the reflection of Overwatch. And what's unfortunate. For people, if you haven't played Battleborn, I really suggest picking it up. It's, I mean, it's 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 relatively inexpensive now, even buying new um, at any retailer. But it's a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, they're so similar. But if you've played both games, they're not. There's a lot, you know, the subtleties, the, the details, and, and you know, I, I I think if you play the games, you can see that there is some things different about them. But I think there's on a the, lot of things different on, about on, them. on the surface, the level tree and everything. On, yeah. on the surface, though, like you see these kind of. This For a casual of, gamer, like you were talking to yeah, someone who doesn't art style, you see the bunch of characters, you hear it's first person shooter. To the to the surface guy, it's the same game. Uh, it's not to us gamers that actually know and give a shit. But to the surface guy, I totally get it, and that's fine. But but you know what? It's funny. Like uh, we were talking about Borderlands earlier. I remember I went to the Dice Summit, which I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, right after Borderlands launched in 2000. You know, Borderlands launched in 2009, and the very next Dice Summit in 2010, they invited me to talk at the summit uh, at DICE. And I went out and talked, and I did a talk about Gearbox and about Borderlands. 
and I, I took a I, I took a risk and I kind of gave some insight into how sales were going and I said this is crazy but you know we're a new IP and I think it looks like and I'm here in February this is months like basically now relative to you know when like it's February now so think about this relative to this product cycles I said it looks like Borderlands might be a three million plus seller it might be it, that which is be incredible but man it's going so well right <laughs> like that was the that and I and I and I was like in and, and, and I remember I got like a call from the take two guys like dude you shouldn't talk about sales man like that's a yeah. publicly traded company I'm yeah like, shit I'm sorry I, I thought I was being vague you know um, but we like we were proud as heck about that and the world was like holy crap gearbox did it man they reached three million people with a new IP that's impossible that's incredible good for them and uh, and of course you know it, it went on and, and kept going and borderlands 2 of course is a big success and franchise wide i think we're somewhere around 30 million units across the whole franchise with borderlands now so that's obviously it's become a much much bigger thing since then but people have tattoos Randy. what's that people have tattoos yeah that's yeah, right yeah, big yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah yeah but like but but rel like relative to borderlands battleborn looks amazing in, in how like how many people we've reached and like that borderlands one you know it's 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 but it's not the same world and it's not and there's other stuff out there so it's kind of really it's really interesting how that works but we love the game and, and we're going to keep at it and and when you know i, I did mention that there, there, there's going to be a, a a free trial announced at some point and the free trial won't it like won't give like there's it'll be like maybe a weekend thing no like, no it, it's going to be a you can play it all you want uh for free it's not but it's not free to play because there's still all the retail content that if you want it you know you got to unlock that with the retail product yeah. So it's not like we're saying anybody that bought retail we're giving away what you bought for free now. Yeah, yeah. There's just it's kind of like what demos used to be, but it's a multiplayer demo, but it's in the same ecosystem. So if you do become, if you do want to buy more stuff or whatever, you don't have to. But if you do want to, uh, you don't have to like start over with your account and start right. You don't. Yeah, you you can you yeah. can just build from what you. That's already right. Have. It's yeah. like it's like a demo that lets you get into the same ecosystem and build from there if you want. But I, but I think when that happens. What I hope is that people that, um, you know, are curious or like, you know, for whatever reason, whether, you know, whatever they're curious about, or if they just want to kind of check it out, they'll, they'll have a chance and they'll go, holy crap, there's something here. Because the people that, that do play the game, they do, they do tend to find that there's something, there's something there. And, you know, and there's, 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 there's also stuff to buy. Like we have metrics like everything else and we can tell, like we know exactly what the attach rate is. We know, we know how it's working with the people that have tried the game and, and it feels pretty good. It's just... We're just living in the shadow of, 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 Blizzard. of Blizzard and Overwatch, yeah. which is awesome for them and great for the genre. And I, I think, if anything, it might help us. I think if they didn't exist, we probably wouldn't have reached three and a half million people, frankly. Yeah, right? I think it just signal boosts the whole idea. Well, that's an incredibly positive attitude to have yeah. because it's true. I mean, I think a lot of people see the, the industry as so black and white that it's like, yeah. but, but in reality, it's like what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Yeah, I, I remember back in the Xbox One, PlayStation 2 era, how everybody wanted to say that like the GameCube was a failure for Nintendo, and I'm like, I, you know, I, I knew enough about their business. Now they're they're actually they're actually the most profitable of all of them. Yeah, they have less total units out so there, like, so, so they so ran a better business. That, that leads that leads to another question <laughs> that someone asked. Uh, let me see if I can find who asked that. If you guys can, um, like, yeah, I think I think someone pretty recently. Oh yeah, it was, so it was it was our friends at Twiak, and uh, the rumor is lately now that everyone's losing their minds about is that the Switch is going to have a virtual console for GameCube games. And my, my, joke, to, my <laughs> joke to that is, is man, if like Nintendo keeps doing like virtual consoles, and then they're, like, I'm always going to be catching up. Like, I'm, yeah, like, right? I'm on my 3DS, I'm playing think, games that. Like, think, I'm playing, yeah. think about That's interesting, right? The idea of like, holy crap, a virtual console for GameCube games? That excites me, right? But now rewind the clock and try to imagine transporting back when it was GameCube, Xbox, and PlayStation 2. Nobody gives a shit if there's a virtual console on Xbox One for the ex for the original Xbox games. Yeah, yeah. What's up with like? See how strange like perception is and well, like, and, like I think perception is a lot different. And, like the Twiach wanted to know, and you're kind of heading in that direction. Is like what you think of the Switch, and I think Nintendo I love lives. N Nintendo lives in a completely different ecosystem. Absolutely, they're not trying to compete with no, the, like, no, with I, Microsoft. No, they're they're not trying to they, Steam. You know, some people look at Nintendo and say, oh, they're losing the video game business. No, they're winning the toy business, right? Like, it's a whole different, they're, they're, they're attacking it from a totally different angle. And you can argue that it's like people, a lot of people are like, well, how well is the Switch going to do? Well, it's sold out. Yeah. It's not out. 
and you can't they sell it. Out, though. They, yeah. they all, but I, I'm pretty bullish about it. I mean, I, I, I've spent my entire life as a Nintendo gamer, well, since Nintendo existed. In fact, you know, Christy and I were talking about earlier, earlier, the first game her and I ever played together, start to finish, as a couple, was the original Final Fantasy on the game at Nintendo. That was yeah. the first game she and I played together. So you're excited about the Switch. So, I, oh, I, I love, I'm a Nintendo fanboy, for yeah. sure. But the, I'll tell you, the thing that I've always dealt with through through my entire existence as a, as a Nintendo fanboy, starting with their launch of the Game Boy, the original Game Boy, was there's kind of like two Nintendo platforms. So there's like whatever the handheld is and whatever the console is. And I love I loved having the Nintendo handheld, the portable, because um, it's portable. But... And I love that they would support it and put good games out for it. But I hated the fact that my, the best experiences Nintendo had to offer could never be portable. Because the portable systems were like, you know, in the Game Boy, the Game Boy era, there was like very low resolution, four color grayscale. Yeah. Four, four gray, it's not even color. The, game, color. the game Boy yeah. was not as even as right. good as the and like, and you look, yeah. Even the 3DS, like the, 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 the fidelity is very low compared to what I can see on my 4K television at home, right? And, and so now, for the first time in Nintendo's history, we're going to have a single platform which is going to serve as both their handheld device and their console device. And what this means is, what Nintendo's really best at is they're, they're, they're as developers. There's the, the software they create, the entertainment experiences they create in the software. And what this means is their very best efforts and their very best talents are going to be directed towards games that I can choose whether I want them to be portable games right. or I want them to be console games or either, and there's no compromise. And that, like, as a, as a game player who knows what it takes to build this stuff and how talent has to be divided amongst different platforms, like, this is the best news imaginable if you love Nintendo games. Loving so. Nintendo games and being, running a studio that is not only a developer, but a publisher now. Oh, yeah. yeah which yeah, I want to talk about. Doing that. Is, is, yeah. is, and I, 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 you know, there's obviously stuff you're working on you can't talk about, but sure. is, uh, are games for the Switch possibly in Gearbox's future or something you've thought about? Oh, I love the platform and I'm always dreaming stuff up, but, you know, I haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time, um, thinking about a Twitch, uh, sorry, Switch specific game yet. Uh, I need, I want to, I want to experience the platform as a customer first. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is, as much as I'm a Nintendo fanboy, I've got to tell you, it's always been really, really difficult as a third party on the platform. If you're not Nintendo, it's really hard to find an audience for your game on their platform. And <clears throat> there's some neat things about the platform. It, it is, uh, it is probably going to be of all the Nintendo platforms to date, it, it might be the easiest to develop for. Uh, which is great from a development point of view, but it's still so significantly different from the other consoles that it's not just, it's not something you can automatically put into parallel development if you're already making, say, an Xbox, PlayStation, and PC game. You can't just add the Switch as a parallel platform without making trade-offs and compromises. So, I th and, and, and the platform is very different too. So I want to experience it as a customer, and I want to, I want to think about what a Switch like a, a product designed for Switch, a game designed for Switch, what that would actually be like. And it could be that there's one there that, that we think of that, that is something we actually want to do. You know, in the, um, in the Wii era, um, when Nintendo you know, told me about that platform, it, did, it, it was like a year before launch when I, when I got to play with the controllers and I, I realized right away, oh my God, I want to play Samba de Amigo on this. Yeah. You know, that was the Sega game with the Maracas. And, um, and I called them up and I said, you guys are doing this right. And they're like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, that has to exist. I'm like, well, we can't, we're busy. We got other stuff. I'm like, well, let me do it. Cause that has to, exist. I would like to make Samba de yeah. Amigo. <laughs> and so, so we made Samba de Amigo for the Wii and it was great. And, um, and, and it, and it, it you know, it wasn't a very expensive project to do, but it was a lot of fun and it felt exactly right. You know, Nintendo said, Hey, we have a platform that's about holding these devices in each hand and shaking them to make the game work. I'm like, my favorite game ever where I hold a thing in each hand and I shake it to make the game work is Samba Dan Amigo. So, <laughs> so that's, that's what we did. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I know that there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of folks that are wondering, like, what happens to Gearbox known franchises on the platform. And, and you know, there, there might be something there, but there's no, there's nothing in development right now. And I really want to experience the game as a customer, uh, experience the platform as a customer, and then we'll see down the road. Um, you know, it's very, very tricky. This, this, it's an entertainment business, 
So you can't predict how the market's going to be. But it, but it's also a business, you know. And, it, and it, I, if I, I'm responsible for the livelihoods of hundreds of people and their families, and and we have to we have to be able to make at least as much as we spend, or we, or we go away and the dream stops. And our dream is just to entertain the world. So and we want to just keep at it and get better and better at it. So so I have to make sure that if 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 we do make a switch game, that it's the kind of game that I can make. That, that, I, that I can at least reach enough people where we make more than a cost to do it. Otherwise, we don't get to keep doing it anymore, and that, that would be the worst strategy of all. That's a good point. And speaking of, speaking of business, this is uh, from Gekkel777 asks, and this is what I like to call the Apple approach, but he'd like to know what you think of Bethesda's recent model of announcing games only a few months before the release, like Fallout 4 and now Morrowind for uh, yeah. Elder Scrolls Online. And you feel like this is a smart move to counter what you're talking about as far as showing early builds too early or having people hate the finished product after it's changed? I think, I think that, that Bethesda's strategy with Fallout 4 was brilliant. And um, there are challenges to that. If, if, if it was a new IP, it would be even harder to execute because there's a, a, an astonishingly complex and not fast-moving machine when you're talking about the retail games business and you're talking about a game that you want to synchronize and launch worldwide. Um, on, in, in, in retail and digitally on all these different platforms and all these different territories and all these different languages. It's, it's just incredible and, and, and almost impossible to, to track and fathom everything that must go on in order to make that work. And, and so you have to have people in the right places caring about each of those outcomes uh, with enough time where they know what the product is and they can actually engage for, the, for, for, their, for their part of it. Um, that time is, is it's not compressible. Um, so, so the more time you have between when you announce and when you launch, the more capable everybody can kind of get on the same page and, and make it work. Uh, uh, but the more time, the, the more chances that the, the dynamics will change between when you announce and when you launch, whether it's in the game or the market or something else. And so, so that, that's the game that we play. I, I think that for a game as big as Fallout 4, uh, I, I can't imagine going any tighter than they went. They, they announced the game at E3, of uh, uh, they, they announced the game at E3 and then they launched it that holiday season. Yeah, uh, and E3, it was like four months. E3 is like, in June, right? So yeah. July, August, November, October. I think they launched in October, right? So yeah. it's five months. five months. And that is that. But but you'll notice when they announced it, they had all their ducks in a row, right? Here was the product. Here's the collector's edition. They already they already knew what the the, the, the here's was. here's the mobile game that's live right now. They already knew what the plastic yeah, was. Yeah. The mobile game was ready to go. Their marketing campaign was already done. So they'd actually been working on that for months. And, and in the case of the limited edition, probably close to a year prior to that moment where they announced, they can do that because they had the confidence in what Fallout would do. There's very few franchises that can do that, right? Uh, Borderlands happens to be one of them. Uh, because you know that when, when another Borderlands game comes, there will be a market that will be ready for it and embrace it and excited for it. And so Borderlands has that chance. But a new IP, it's really scary to spin that much stuff up and not tell anybody until you're on the eve of launch. You, you have to commit an absurd amount of resources, and if, and if with a new IP, you can't be sure. And if you lose your ass, then... You might not get to come again. Right. So, so you know, it's really, really tricky stuff. Here. So it's a, it's a um, good dynamic if you have the product and the and the fan base to back it up immediately. Now, now I do have to say, and, and everyone that might listen to my words on this might, might has to consider. Yes, we uh, Gearbox is starting to publish now, but I am a developer. Like I, I'm kind of I, I've been I've been in this career for a long time. I've been making games for a long time, so I've learned a lot of the things that suits think about. But I'm not a suit, man. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a craftsman. I you just out, wear magic suits. I, I started yeah. out as a, as a da -da -da -da. I started out as a coder. You know, I have my shitty art is in games. I have, I, I, I you know, I'm a designer. I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm talent. I'm not, I'm not a suit. But I, I have spent enough time in this industry where I've kind of learned how some of these things work. So I think yeah. I can kind of speak intelligently about some of them. Um, and that, that's that's where those opinions come from. So they they come from. The, the, what I just explained comes from a position not of like I'm the guy that's pulling these strings. It comes from I, I think it's how these strings are being pulled. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just trying to make stuff and hope hope hope, the world, hope, hope that it sticks. Hope it works. Hope yeah. the world works. So I just hope we entertain people. That's really what, what we care about. So we're starting to wrap up with time. Did you guys have anything that you would like to ask? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hit them with the final bomb. Is hit them with the final bomb. Yeah. I'm good, man. That was awesome. I feel very 
it's very uh, entertained and knowledge just Are you entertained? Soaking in. By the pitch so, <laughs> By the pitch <laughs> I think we're about to be entertained when you drop the bomb. So, so, the so you got, like, I mean, what, what can you tell us about Borderlands 3? I mean, you guys have announced <laughs> and unannounced it. I mean, like, in, in, a, well, in a kind of way. You said that we, the next we game... We haven't announced it. But, yeah. you know, there's there's no secret that we're working on more Borderlands, right? Like, And I, and I, I, I think I went to PAX out a couple years ago and said, hey, if there's talent out there that would like to be a part of it, uh, now would be a good time to, to let me know who you are and, because we're going we're gonna to grow a team for, for the next Borderlands project. Um, so obviously we're working on something, um, but no, we, we haven't announced it yet. Um, and I, I can't say exactly when we will. Um, uh, and I, I don't even know what it's going to be called, right? Because we're still, you know, it's still um, early enough. Like, you know, we, we, the last Borderlands game was Borderlands the pre-sequel. Like, I think it was right to not call that Borderlands 3. Right. right. That, that was not a true. But but even like there's it also, was a pre sequel. I mean, it was, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I'll tell you the 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 um, I, for some I have this weird thing where I hate the numbers, but I get why they're useful for the for like they're simple, right? You know, oh, this is the next one in the series. So da 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 three or da 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 four or da 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 two or whatever. Um, I think a very Borderlands thing to do would be to just skip three and call the next one Borderlands four. I think that'd be hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What happened to three? We don't talk about three. Well, I mean, like it's kind we of do funny. Do not because, talk about three. You know, <laughs> Vol Volition did something really similar. Yeah. Whereas in Saints Row, you know, they called their third called Saints Row the third because it was the yeah. third street yeah. Saints. Yeah. yeah. And like while Saint like while Saints Row four was Saints Row four, they they, they had like kind of funny add-ons to it. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. But that doesn't make sense because it would be technically the fourth Borderlands it is, game. It is. You know. In, in the franchise, That's but right. it's not three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, by that same logic, maybe Borderlands the pre-sequel is Borderlands 1.5. I don't know. Just call it. Just call it. Just call it Pandora Four. <laughs> <laughs> just confuse everything. Yeah. Just confuse but, everyone. But, I, I will say this: if you want some tease, um, this isn't for the game, but um, we are working on a bunch of stuff. We're working on some technology, and I'm actually going to be going to GDC in a couple of weeks. And uh, our partners, our technology partners, Epic Games, uh, they have a keynote uh, that they do uh, for Unreal Engine, and we're going to be a part of that. And I'm going to be showing off some prototypical rendering stuff that we're thinking about, uh, and also some stuff that we're kind of exploring with the technology. And we are, I am using um, uh, uh, a very, you know, to, to explore what Unreal Engine can do, I'm using a very Borderlands art direction. So if it, it might, it's not the game, uh, and it's not it's not about any particular project. But, but you know, people are going to latch on to. But it. It, but <laughs> if, if someone wants to get a early look of, of what it might look like if we tried to render with a, a Borderlands looking game with modern technology on on the latest cutting edge you know hardware that exists. Um, that that would be a great place to look, um, and I'll probably give people some hints about that. I'm gonna I'm gonna be at GDC doing this uh, closer to the event. I'm sure Epic will want to shout from the loud, loudest, the tallest mountain that, yeah, like, that hey, this is gonna happen. So they'll probably look, look, do check it out on Rio and see what so, it could yeah, look like but, from Gearbox. But but um, it's I don't want to get up any false hopes it's not the game it's not it's not even a game it's just it's just some technology like in in the tools it's not yeah. it's not even a, it's not even gameplay it's just we're going to show some technology in the tools but if you if you're curious about what it might look like to render um you know a, a, the borderlands art direction in, in the latest greatest technology uh that that will you'll that'll see be that. where to you'll check it out yeah. it's coming up and speaking of things that are coming up i it would i would i would hate to not leave on this note because the new publishing division yeah. of Gearbox, the very first, and this is the it's very its first own company. Game. It's its own company. Yeah, Gearbox is Publishing. Bulletstorm Full it's actually, Edition. It's actually going to be the fourth game, Gearbox. The fourth yeah. game. The first was Homeworld Remastered. That's right. And then Homeworld Deserts of Karak, and then the Duke Nukem 20th Anniversary Edition. Uh, or 20th anniversary world tour is what they called it, and now Bulletstorm Bullet Full Clip Edition is coming. Full Clip is coming out in April. Yeah. In April, yeah, with people can fly. That's right. One of, oh, one of my yeah. honestly, one of my favorite first-person shooters I felt was the most underrated games yeah. of all time. It's I was so crazy it's, fun. It's so crazy. I always joke that it's the Tony Hawk of shooters. I yes. wish I made that game. I yeah. wish I made that game. It is so fucking fun. And, and you guys are putting and, and a lot of people didn't know about it. You know, I think those guys got really boned because. They got owned by, you know, they got bought by Epic, and Epic, and they had a great game, and Epic definitely helped them get a, like a better 
kind of publishing arrangement yeah. than they probably would have gotten on their own. But what, what happened there was, you know, EA signed that deal to publish that game, and I think EA did do it for Bulletstorm. I think they did it to try to get in with Epic, hoping they'd get a bigger piece out of Epic later or something, right? And so, although there was kind of like a okay effort to get behind the game or publish it, it wasn't it wasn't what the game deserved. Right. Now, that game like was like I think it was like eighty eight or eighty nine Metacritic or something like really high. It was like, really well rated game. And, yeah. and it was and it, and it only was not ninety plus because it was like who are these Polish guys? You know what what it like? I think like to me that was one of the best games of the year. It was so freaking fun. And uh, what happened? You know, people can fly regain their independence. Epic let, let them loose and, and let them keep their property. And what did these guys do? They just went into the tank and rebuilt their game uh, for Xbox One and PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro. Yeah. So it runs at like 60 FPS and 4K. It's just nice. like I happen to have Holy a PlayStation 4 crap, Pro. It's unbelievable, and it looks freaking amazing, and it's super fast and super fun. And I I, I wish I'd made that game. And the fact that um, that Sebastian over there uh, is is trusting up to trusting us to help help him reach customers with it is just cool as fuck you know it's yeah. like but you know to be fair though i think it's a good move for him you know we set up gearbox publishing because we wanted to be the most developer friendly publishers on the planet and the deal that we did with him like he's getting this is unheard of i, I get we, we were creating deals for third-party developers that are the kind of deals i wish i had yeah right? so he get for the first for the first pile of units sold until he's way made his money back and then and is profitable um, he's getting a hundred percent royalty rate. Like we are literally making no money until That's until insane. he's made his money back and wow. he's profitable. Cool. Him first, and, and it should be that way. I shouldn't publish it unless I believe in it. Yeah. Right. So so he gets all, he gets to make his money back first. He gets to make his profit first. Then we participate with him 50-50 for a while until we recover the cost it took us to do it, and then it goes seventy thirty in his favor. Wow. That's insane. No nope, developer ever gets anything close to that. Like, like the best we get, with, like, when, I remember when I started out with Half-Life Opposing Force, I got, like, 16%. Wow. Can you believe that shit? Yeah. And I, the only reason I can say that is because Sierra Online's out of business now. So <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> screw like, No, no. I, I mean, we have to sign confidentiality agreements and all this stuff that, like, we can't even disclose this kind of stuff. Yeah. But, they gave me sixteen percent, and I not you know we knocked that game out of the park. That game was amazing, and everybody loved it, and it sold like like an uh, order of magnitude more than they expected, and it signal boosted uh, Half Life itself. You know when Half Life launched, it did like four hundred forty thousand units in its launch window. Can you believe that shit? You would you wouldn't think so. Four hundred forty thousand yeah. units. That's like, how amazing and then, popular it is. I know, right? It's it's, yeah. the, it's one of the greatest games ever made, right? It deserves to you know do forty million units, but uh, you know we signal we. The, the pro, the, then, then they were able to repackage our product with theirs and make bundles, and it really it helped for, for become a franchise. So, so I really did a lot for that, um, and the team that, that, that worked on the game with me did did so much. And and what they the reward we got when we did the next one, Half Life Blue Ship, we got twenty percent. We got twenty percent. You got that four percent boost. Oh but my instead, god! Instead, people can fly out making a hundred percent. Yeah. Until and, they and, then, and, then, and then and then once we're clear, it's seventy percent in their favor. So so and I want Sebastian to be able to. I'm not. I'm saying you don't have to keep the secret. I want you to scream from the highest mountain. It's pretty cool transparency. And and, 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 and when when and I want you know he's not going to brag a lot about it until till it all is true, right? We need the results to come in. But I want him to scream from the highest mountain. I want every developer that's got kick-ass, awesome stuff uh, to look up Gearbox and let us help help you reach market. Because, you know, we've been fortunate and we've gotten to a point where we can actually do this stuff now. We've become sort of, you know, we're, we're officially licensed publishers on all the platforms and we can do this now. And it's, it's hard. I mean, it took us over a year for Microsoft to be okay with us to publish on Xbox, you know, and PlayStation's <laughs> that's that's even gnarlier, you know. PlayStation's PlayStation, right? So, um, the fact that we can show up as an independent, that's developer friendly, is really really rare. And and I love the big publishers. Like I, you know, some people have asked, are we going to be able to publish Borderlands or something? It's like I can't do that. I'm not I'm not there yet. So don't don't bring me AAA stuff because I'll, I'll we won't do as good of a job as the big guys that have you know big stuff everywhere. Uh, but for little things like we can, we will help you do a lot better than, than than you would ever do on your own. We can help you get into retail. We can help you get on platforms that are hard, not as like the independent developer path, but as a real path where you, yeah. get, you get real, real, real signal boosting and real, real money for it. And um, and uh, and we'll do that with 
uh, with joy and happiness and passion and uh, as gamers and as developers, which is really, really rare because we're, get, we're in the games business. We're not in the stock business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's a big difference. It's, there is a big difference. It's there's astonishing. The All these guys are in the stock market business. They're not actually in the games business. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's just something, something that I, I feel very strongly about and I hope we can make a difference there in the market and the industry. Well, it certainly seems like an exciting passion project. Brady, I can't thank you enough for uh, taking the time and hanging out with us here in the booth Woo on Redbeard Live. Woo -woo! A lot of good stuff coming up for you guys. Um, things, unannounced things that, that people can be excited about. But of course, <laughs> but of course, Bulletstorm uh, coming out from Gearbox Publishing. We're going to be at um, PAX East, and I think we're going to have Bulletstorm there on the floor. People can play it. Um, one of the cool things about it, if you pre-order um, for free, you'll get... Uh, you'll unlock the ability to play the entire game as Duke Nukem. Oh, nice. And it's not just playing as the character. Like, we got John St. John in the booth, and we rewrote and re-recorded all of the dialogue. For so him. it's as if Duke is the hero of the game. And it why is, wouldn't you play it? It is freaking <laughs> hilarious. Well, the reason why that came about is because, well, we own Duke, and, you know, said said, like, Duke... Duke Nukem was an inspiration for Battle for for Bulletstorm. It's a, it's a it's it's part of the attitude and the style of the game. It's, it just fits. Yeah, and so like okay, let's do it. This will be a lot of fun, and uh, it's a blast. And we're gonna I think we're gonna do some contests there and give away a bunch of stuff. And we're also at PAX East. We're gonna do the main theater show at the main theater at PAX East, and we'll probably be announcing and talking about some other stuff there. So um, and that all comes out before. Bulletstorm comes out, so if anybody happens to be in or around Boston or is going to PAX East, um, definitely check that out because you'll get some advantages than, than if, if you, you know, become a, a regular customer on the, in, the world, in the wild. Well, shit, I want to go. Yeah, right. yeah. PAX East, you should. Yeah, PAX is a lot of fun. Have you ever been to PAX? I've been, I've been, I've been, yeah. to, PAX, I've been to PAX Prime and PAX I've been to PAX now. Yeah. I haven't been to PAX East. PAX East is pretty... You I haven't know, been to Boston. I'll tell you the sure thing I love about PAX East, it has a board game meaning to it. Just, oh, like The board games are just massive at PAX East. And I, you know, I'm, I love video games. But you it's love my tabletop. life. But I also love tabletop games. That's I mean, right. that's that's one of the reasons. That's what that's what Nirvana is. Coffee yeah. is. Yeah. You can come on, play some something yeah. like a tan. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, Randy, tell them where they can follow you on Twitter. Oh, uh, my Twitter handle is at Duval Magic. D U V A L M A G I C. Um, you know. So, just give a follow. Send me whatever you want. Sometimes they'll retweet you. Yeah, if you're nice. Yeah, yeah. If you're nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you so much to Shane and Mike, my my lovely compadres. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you guys. Yeah. Make sure Sh Shane and Mike on the controls. Shane and yeah. Mike yeah. on the one and Working the ones and twos. Make sure you guys make sure you guys give us a follow if you haven't already. Uh, every single Wednesday night at 7 p.m. we stream right here at Nerd Bonnet. You can come up to the restaurant or the coffee shop. And see us in person, and you never know—you might see a, a random Randy Pitchford in the wild. Uh, you should absolutely yeah. come to to the restaurant and see Mandy at the bar. Mandy at the bar, or uh, uh, so your Christige. That's right, uh, the the Christige. The Christige. The Christige. We've been educated, but, but the, you, know, you can call it the Christige if you like. <laughs> either either way, either it's way. delicious. It's fantastic, That's and we're gonna we're gonna jump off because we're gonna go grab one. Awesome, right now. absolutely. Or Cheers, everybody. Woo!